Hey there Martians, Trace here. This is episode three of five on this series about leaving Earth. So far we've talked about why we have to leave Earth. We've talked about the ways that we're gonna be able to do it, hopefully in the future, and some of the ways that we're doing it right now. But now we're gonna talk about where we're gonna go. I'm super excited about this. We have to leave the planet eventually. We have to. The planet is gonna die. We're gonna destroy it. It will be destroyed. If humans wanna be around in say a million years, we cannot rely on nature to adapt us to that. We must rely on us to adapt us to that. Nature got us this far, we need to go the next mile. So where should we go? The Mars? I asked some friends, so let's kick into it. If we learned anything from the last episode, it is that rockets of the future will be a lot like rockets now. But we need people to actually want to go places, and we need a place to go. Thanks to people like Elon Musk, a lot of people are thinking Mars, but is this viable? Well, the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine got together in 2014 and wrote a paper that answered just that entitled Pathways to Exploration, colon, Rationales and Approaches for a U.S. Program of Human Space Exploration. It's almost 300 pages. And it's all about how human space flight should be and also can be. My friend Ariel was on that council, so I called her. I'm Ariel Waldman. I'm an advisor to NASA. I advise the NASA Innovative Advanced Concepts Program that looks at futuristic ideas ideas that could transform future space missions anywhere between 10 to 40 years down the line, which, you know, here on Earth, antibiotics might be able to be shelf stable for maybe a year or so, but expose them to radiation, maybe they're not as stable. So things like that are important. The National Research Council says that there is basically no way that we can do this because the NASA's budget has been flat. It's not even adjusted for inflation. It's essentially flat year over year. Every year that means because it's not adjusted for inflation, we're giving NASA less money to work with. The National Research Council's findings say that they need to increase NASA's budget for two to four percent above inflation for years. And in doing so, they can then work on a Mars landing. And we need to do that with other space agencies around the world because there ain't gonna be no America moment on Mars. We gotta do this together. No one nation can go to Mars on their own because it is that much more difficult to go to Mars than the moon. And we need to have everything go perfectly in sort of a unicorn and rainbows world. And that would mean that we would be landing humans on the surface of Mars somewhere in the 2050s. I think people in this way sort of underestimate just how much is needed to go to Mars versus going to the moon. And actually, I think that is so awesome. We have to become interplanetary together as a group, not as a nation or a state or a little pithy description or even a single company or group. Instead, as a people, a populace, a species, which just feels right when you're talking about leaving Earth forever. What wouldn't feel right is we all hate waiting. And no matter when we leave the planet, we're going to wait. Not only are we going to wait till the 2050s to actually leave, but once we get to Mars, we're going to have to wait. This idea that like we land and then like after five minutes, we'll just like open the hatch and go on a walk. Like they're not going to be able to do that. When you actually get astronauts onto the surface of Mars, everyone imagines this a monumental moment where like the doors open, they've arrived on Mars and now they're just going to go step out onto Mars. The reality is, is that when astronauts go to Mars, they're probably going to have to spend like the first week or two inside that space shuttle or rocket or whatever they came in because they won't be able to walk. It's going to be too difficult for them to walk on Mars because of uh, the loss of all of that bone and, and muscle. See, this is why people say scientists ruin everything. Humans did not evolve to live anywhere else, just here. Yes, we can go places, we can climb mountains. Top of mountains will also kill us though. We can dive underwater and being underwater will kill you after a while because you know, you can't breathe or you get crushed by the pressure, whatever. Space, very similar. Another consideration for going to Mars is that you actually want to go to Mars during solar maximum rather than solar minimum. And this is because the sun uh, will actually protect you from uh, extra galactic cosmic rays, which can be incredibly damaging when, in terms of radiation and what they can do to the body. There's a little bit to unpack here. Earth has a magnetic field, like a bubble, like shields surrounding our planet, and it stops us from dying. 
So thanks, magnetic field. Thank you, it, it's great. And it does this by scattering solar and cosmic energies that are flying around in space all the time. The sun is constantly sending out the solar wind, it's high energy particles, it's high energy rays. And if those things hit our DNA, it can hurt us. Deep space is also sending cosmic energies our direction. And some of these cosmic rays from deep space aren't just invisible energy. They're literally tiny bits of atoms, tiny protons flying through space super fast. And when they hit something, they burst into X-rays. I think we all know lots of X-rays is bad. And since these are such high energy particles, it can be damaging to our DNA. Mars is a difficult place to live on the best of days. The average temperature is negative 63 Celsius. Not that that matters so much because it's got no atmosphere, which means you can't really breathe there. And the atmosphere is a hundred times thinner than Earth. Remember when Frank Sinatra sang, up there where the air is rarefied. Pop songs, they don't use SAT words anymore, but atmospheric pressure that low means a rarefied atmosphere. It's rarefied air, it's thin. Atmospheric pressure at 0.6% of Earth means that it doesn't actually matter that it's cold on Mars because you won't really feel it because you're not actually feeling the temperature, you're feeling the air on your skin. That's the sort of a sidebar. Anyway, also bad would be radiation in general. Without that bubble, the cosmic rays and the sun's solar wind and the sun's radiation could hurt us. The sun seems all nice and yellow and friendly here on Earth, but in reality, it is a giant nuclear plasma furnace and it's not out there to protect us. It's out there because it is. Long-term exposure to radiation on Mars could cause sickness and cancer, genetic damage, and even death. So just going to Mars to live, maybe not the best idea. The way I describe having a large population on Mars is why on earth would you want to have a large group of people in, in an intensive care unit? I'm just maybe too acutely aware of how lethal the place is. I mean, it, it really is lethal. And why on earth would you want to raise kids there? That ray of Martian sunshine is Pascal Lee. I'm a planetary scientist with the Mars Institute and the SETI Institute. I'm based at uh, NASA Ames, but all opinions are my own, and I think most people are happy they are. Pascal has spent his career thinking about humans going to Mars, and I gotta say, he is not that into it. I live and breathe space and space exploration. I've done that all my life, and I really want to see humans go back to the moon and, and go to Mars. Okay. But somehow, I, I don't resonate with the settlers. I think a lot of the attraction of Mars stems from the romantic view that's inspired by the Martian landscape. I mean, it looks like, you know, the, the unconquered frontier. I would prefer to see Mars becoming a, you know, a world park that is studied scientifically with a research base and even several research bases, a bit like Antarctica, and have tourists and Earth people have an opportunity to spend time there, live there, enjoy the place a bit, but, you know, not raise kids. I mean, you might have one park ranger who might be raising you know, her family there. That's not settling Mars, okay? I mean, that, that's, that comes with the territory of being a park ranger. <laughs> what if we lived under the surface and we used local Martian resources? Would that be better? Of course. A cave is a really exciting environment on the moon and Mars because you are shielded from high energy ionizing radiation from the galaxy and from deep space and from the sun. You are also shielded from micrometeorite impacts. You are shielded from the ultraviolet light. On the Mars, it's 800 times more intense than on the Earth because there's no ozone. A study by Beagle 2, a Mars probe, found that below 190 nanometers, waves heading to Mars were blocked. Mars' atmosphere was rarefied, but it was enough that it would block UV radiation below 190 nanometers. But above that, not so much, and UVC and UVB radiation would fall above that. So if you were on Mars as an astronaut and somehow exposed your skin to the sun, you'd get a gnarly sunburn because there wouldn't be enough atmosphere to stop all of that high energy from hitting your skin. And of course, over a very short period of time, it would damage your DNA. So you've heard for, you've heard against, but let's wrap it up. Should we go to Mars or not? 
Hey, it's Ariel here again. The rationales for putting humans in space are actually really fascinating. And the conclusion was that there are pragmatic rationales and there are aspirational rationales. The pragmatic rationales are things like boost to the economy, national security, inspiration of students, things of that nature, you know, science development. On the aspirational side, however, if we need to become a multi-planetary species to survive or it's our shared human destiny to explore, then humans spaceflight provides something unique. The conclusion, though, was that it was the combination of the aspirational rationales with the pragmatic rationales that argues for a continuation of human spaceflight, and that no one rationale was better than another, and no one rationale garnered majority of support. We can be a multi-planet culture and species by having footholds on all these places. But without kidding ourselves, and necessarily everywhere we go, we need to turn that into a home because, well, Oh, we, we just haven't even done that on the earth. There are some places that are more pleasant than others. But maybe you're watching this and you're thinking, honestly, I'm still confused about the whole rocket stuff. Hume, me, I feel you. This is when I go over to Brilliant. With Brilliant, I can learn a little bit every single day. I can learn about quantum physics or machine learning, calculus, waves and light, gravitational physics, problem solving, even just logic puzzles. It is so awesome, y'all. Personally, I never really get something, like really get it deep down until I get the why of it. And Brilliant helps me get there. For example, I wanted to know more about interference in radio telescopes. I know it's a really niche thing. It's covered in a lot of videos I've done and I've talked to experts about it and I'm like, still confused? So I took the course over on Brilliant about light and waves and I found myself saying, huh, a lot, which is a good thing, by the way, if you're learning and you're like, huh, that's really cool. So I think I actually get interference now, which is a super awesome feeling. Try out Brilliant. Let me know if you learned something new. Just click over to brilliant.org slash trace or grab the link down in the description. You can sign up for free and satisfy your curiosity while building even more curiosity. The first 200 people to try it will get 20% off of Brilliant's premium subscription. And I cannot speak highly enough about this tool. They even have an app so you can learn on the go. Plus, if you try it, you support me too. Okay, but let's head back. Okay, so according to Pascal Lee and Ariel, Mars is out. Mars is good for science, but not great for living. I mean, not for now. For long-term living, we would need to figure out how to stop cosmic rays, where to live, how to get stuff up there, and not to mention the psychological aspects of never being able to go outside at all. You can't feel a breeze that wasn't moved by a fan or a person walking by you. Maybe not the best. But that doesn't mean we have to not go to Mars. I think Mars is still valuable as a research base, as maybe even a national park. But right now, maybe we should think about something just a little closer. Right? If we are toddlers in the world of space exploration, let's not try and go to the next bedroom over. Let's just explore the room we have. And that means going to the moon. Could we live there forever? You'll have to find out more next time. Make sure you subscribe for all of the episodes in this series. We're halfway through. That was episode three. Next is episode four about living on the moon. And then we get to episode five and that's gonna be big. So make sure you subscribe. Again, I am Trace. Thank you so much for tuning in to this series on leaving Earth, and I will see you in the future.